The following information provides evidence-based step-by-step guidelines on how to properly perform an intubation via direct laryngoscopy, as well as a preoperative airway assessment. This video pairs with the attached fluency. There are many indications for tracheal intubation, several of which are shown here. Please pause to review. Contraindications for intubation are limited. Some examples include abnormal airway anatomy that can be made worse by intubation and decrease the effectiveness of bag mask ventilation. In these situations, if manual ventilation is sufficient, the provider may continue until a definitive surgical airway, such as cricothyroidotomy or a tracheostomy, has been secured. The skill set of the provider must also be considered in determining whether or not intubation may be more harmful than beneficial for the patient. Finally, refusal. This is a very delicate subject that requires intense consideration on a case-by-case -case basis. So confirm the patient's code status, refer to standards of care, state regulations, and your facility's policy. Here's a list of abbreviations used throughout this video. This screen contains a list of steps that need to be completed before bringing the patient back to the OR. These steps are very important for the patient's safety. The decided anesthesia plan will be based on a review of the patient's chart and of their physical assessment. The airway assessment is of special importance, so let's explain how to properly perform that next. As a whole, the assessments on the screen can be very useful tools in predicting intubation difficulty. Before beginning, discuss the importance of the airway assessment with the patient since it will determine the specific equipment needed to care for them. The LEMON mnemonic is commonly used to guide proper airway assessment. LEMON is an acronym for look externally, evaluate using the 332 rule, malampati scoring, obesity or obstruction, and neck mobility. Other than key information in the patient's chart, looking externally should be the initial assessment completed to notice any overt indicators that intubation might be difficult, for instance, poor dentition or morbid obesity. Evaluating with the 332 rule is another method used to determine the likelihood of intubation success. The first three assess as if the patient is able to open their mouth enough to fit three fingers between their upper and lower incisors. If they can, there's a greater likelihood that the laryngoscope blade will fit as well. The second three in this mnemonic refers to the ability to place three fingers between the anterior mandible and anterior neck, which gives a rough estimate of the submandibular space, also known as a thyromental distance. If the distance is less than three finger breaths, roughly six centimeters, submandibular space is limited, so moving the tongue into this area with the blade enough to get an adequate glottic view will be difficult. If the space is greater than nine centimeters, intubation may also be more challenging because the glottic opening can be too caudal to visualize. The two notes the ability to place two fingers between the thyroid cartilage and the base of the mandible. A rough estimate of the larynx location is obtained via this method. If two fingers cannot fit, the larynx may be too cephalic, so getting a good view of the glottic opening will likely be difficult. The Malampati score system is a tool used to determine how much space in the mouth the tongue occupies. Scoring ranges from 1 to 4. The more space the tongue occupies in the mouth, the higher the Malampati score will be. A higher score translates into a greater likelihood of a difficult intubation. The next two considerations are obstruction and obesity. Obstruction refers to anything in the pharyngeal space, such as a mass or trauma, that may interfere with access to the glottis. The importance of obesity must not be discounted because many obese patients have redundant pharyngeal tissue that can make intubation difficult and cause rapid desaturation once anesthetized. The patient's neck mobility is assessed in pre-op because the sniffing position requires neck manipulation and is a very important component of successful intubation. If the patient has limited neck range of motion, it's critical to know why in order to avoid causing serious cervical injury and to prepare for accommodations that limit neck movement during intubation. The next focus is on mismades. Mismades is another mnemonic that's used as a checklist to make sure the anesthesia machine, as well as all equipment and medications needed for induction, will be ready for use before the patient arrives to the OR. Since Ms. Mays is discussed in greater detail during lectures, only summary information will be provided in this video. The Ms. Mays acronym begins with machine. Here this refers to performing a check to assess the integrity of the ventilator portion of the machine as well as ensuring properly functioning auxiliary O2, sufficient O2 in the backup cylinder, enough potent inhalation agent, and a CO2 absorbent that's not exhausted. Next is suction. This should be turned on and ready at the head of the bed. 
All connections and suction functioning must be checked carefully. Only listening for the sound of suction is not a reliable indicator that it's in working order. Monitor refers to all standard monitoring equipment, including the pulse oximeter, a properly sized blood pressure cuff, EKG, end tidal CO2, and temp probe, as well as any additional items needed for advanced monitoring, such as an arterial line. Everything must be set up and ready for use. Alarms must be on and audible and properly set for the patient, for instance, peds versus adults. Airway includes any equipment that can be used to ensure proper ventilation. The presence of correctly sized items must be confirmed. Examples of standard equipment include a face mask, oral or nasal airways, and endotracheal tubes. Size 7 to 7.5 internal diameter ETT is often chosen for women and size 7.5 to 8 are often selected for men. However, it's important to opt for the most appropriate size for the patient based on their anatomy or specific considerations. A stylet should be inserted into the ETT. A 10 ml syringe should be attached to the pilot balloon. It's also necessary to prepare the laryngoscope handle and blade as well as check light function. Mac or Miller blades are two popular options for blades and the one chosen should be based on the patient's need and provider's level of comfort. Backup airway equipment such as an Ambu bag, a properly sized supraglottic airway, video laryngoscope, bougie, crite kit, etc. should also be present. IV serves as a reminder to check the patient for a functioning IV prior to induction. An IV start kit must be ready as well as choice IV fluids. Confirm an adequate amount of IV pumps present in the OR. Drugs refer to induction agents, neuromuscular blockers if needed, and any supportive medications such as vasoactives, anticholinergics, predetermined antibiotics, analgesics, and other appropriate medications. Special is a catch-all for any uncategorized necessities, including a warming blanket, oral gastric tube, bis monitor, etc. Now moving on to procedure. Be sure to maintain universal precautions. The provider should at minimum be wearing a surgical cap, a surgical mask, and gloves once hand hygiene has been performed. When the patient arrives to the OR, it's necessary to participate in a timeout and confirm the patient's ID with at least two identifiers. Appropriate monitors should be placed on the patient to obtain baseline vitals. If the patient has no limitations on neck mobility, now is a good time to put them into the sniffing position by extending their head and flexing their neck. This position aligns the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes and optimizes glottic visualization. Next, pre-oxygenate the patient by turning the FiO2 to 100% at 10 or more liters per minute for several minutes until the ETO2 is 90%. At this point, perform a final pre-induction assessment of both the patient and their vitals. If satisfied, induction medications can now be given. Here's a list of some commonly used perioperative medications. There's a lot of content on the screen. Please feel free to pause and review. Anesthesia induction is first confirmed by apnea. Look for an absence of chest rise, mask condensation, and end tidal CO2. Then assess the eyelash reflex. If absent, tape the eyes closed to avoid a corneal abrasion. Now that the patient is apneic, mask ventilation is required. Before beginning, slightly close the APL but keep the setting less than 20 to avoid gastric insufflation. Confirm proper ventilation via bilateral chest rise and a consistent end tidal CO2 tracing. Once the ability to mask ventilate is confirmed, a baseline train of four must be checked. Then administer the appropriate neuromuscular blocker and continue mask ventilating. Required mask ventilation time varies based upon the drug onset. Jaw relaxation and a decreased amount of force needed to squeeze a reservoir bag will begin to be noticed. After sufficient time and jaw relaxation occurs, a second train of four must be done to confirm intubation readiness. 
With sufficient anesthetic depth and paralysis, scissor the patient's mouth and insert the blade at the right corner. Sweep the tongue to the left and into the submandibular space. Avoid tissue and teeth damage. If a MAC blade is used, the blade tip will be positioned in the vollecula to indirectly lift the epiglottis. A Miller blade will go beneath the epiglottis and directly lift it. Both blades displace the epiglottis. Once lifted, the glottic opening should be revealed. Look for additional anatomical landmarks and be sure to verbalize them to your preceptor. After a traumatic introduction of the endotracheal tube past the vocal cords, withdraw the stylet and advance the endotracheal tube to a proper depth. Here's a list of generic guidelines. The final decision should be based on what's best for the individual patient. Next, inflate the pilot balloon, then connect the endotracheal tube to the circuit. Once that's completed, proceed to confirm proper placement. Confirmation methods are listed here and must be verbalized. They include equal and bilateral chest movement, condensation inside the ETT, equal and bilateral breath sounds, and adequate and consistent entitled CO2 tracing that's present for greater than three to five breaths. If the intubation was not successful, recognizing the need to forego the attempt and resume mask ventilation is also a crucial step. After the endotracheal tube has been properly placed, turn on the selected potent inhalation agent, decrease fresh gas flows, choose a proper ventilation mode, and initiate mechanical ventilation. Secure the endotracheal tube at the appropriate depth with tape. Finally, document the procedure.